Hello YouTube, Mr. Report newsletter and Tutor Chat subscribers. This is Terrell from Terrell03.com. The day is February 25th, 2020. And this is the Mr. Report newsletter number 8 for 2020. And uh, my apologies for running late. This is a uh, more action than than uh, terrell03.com has seen ever the coronavirus the COVID-19 scare I mean, has me spooked has a lot of other people spooked and for good reason too so um, I'll, I'll give you an update on that here in a few and uh, the chat room will be open this evening for chat uh, tutor chat subscribers at 7 o'clock 7 to 9 p.m. please have your questions ready so we can make the most of the time. The um, see before we go any further, this special notice is going to be in the newsletter from now on, just like it's in the Project Black Star newsletter. This concerns if you are a subscriber. I'm not talking about a YouTube subscriber. I'm talking about a newsletter subscriber here at the website. A newsletter subscriber means that you are. You have subscribed to one of these four programs. These are only two dollars per month. Two dollars per month for the mystery report. You want the the tutor chat upgrade? Then that's fifty dollars per year. Did I say twenty-five dollars per month? That's twenty-five dollars per year. And somebody asked me because they didn't realize it says twenty-five dollars. It doesn't say per year anywhere. So, um, but that's what it is. That's what it's been from the beginning. And silly me, I'm thinking that everybody knows. But I'll, uh, next time I'm up, updating the site, which I promised you I would last week, and I just, my apologies, I just really haven't had time. At some point, I'm just going to keel over from uh, all the activity, I'm trying to get the work done here on the trailer, trying to get out of where I'm at. And uh, we, we could be in lockdown easily in 30 days, easily, like China, like Italy, like other places. The world is getting ready to change. So... Um, if you're one of these subscribers, then you qualify for this special offer. This is really, really special because for a $50 donation, as long as you're in the continental United States or if you're in Hawaii, too, Doug just informed me of that, then uh, you qualify to get na um, Doug's Nano Silver, not Colloidal Silver. This is better. This gets into the nooks and crannies. This is going to kill the coronavirus. It's not just that. This this is part of this is what you should have on hand anyway beautiful antiviral that's what Mindy uses the clinical uh, um, biologist lady that helped me with in the past she said she was glad that it was being mentioned so if you're a subscriber then you qualify for this then um, before we get into the report there's uh, another awakened radio John's giving us one per week. This is the uh, the most recent one that's been uploaded right here. And this is the Bible chat. So we missed a week in here, but this is the chat from last week. We'll be there tonight, and we'll be making another recording of that, too. You have access to that right here in the um, weekly news. Remember, these newsletters are only 2 bucks a month. There's about $0.50 cents an issue is what you're talking about. And then you're going to qualify for programs like this you're also going to get a copy of my book the mystery explained for free the ebook version attached to your notification email so now we have that out of the way I want to go through the uh, the main report this is what I want to do last week it's fun to share if you read the newsletter last week then you saw Helena's article and I read through it quite impressed and there were places where I disagreed but he'd have time to say last week and then, uh, so this is this is her full, full article. It's right here from last week. As you can see, she writes, writes like me, not nice and long. Lots of commentary. So this is where I'm going to uh, begin addressing what she's saying. So uh, you know, I just start off. Hi, Elna, and thank you for writing and sharing. And while we agree on many interpretations of God's living word, please allow me to offer comments on some of the points where we may disagree. 
And um, so she just starts off, she's writing about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which Brian and I and Trevor and I and lots of people have discussed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 6, are perhaps the most difficult verses of the entire, all of the Pauline epistles to get right. The problem which Elena points out is that they have, Paul had explained everything to these Thessalonians face to face. And he was writing them. That's why that there are bits and pieces missing from both letters. Because when you, when you fill a church in on exactly what's going on personally, and you're there waving your arms around and telling them, and then you write them a letter where you can, you're going to refer to comments that you made while you were there, it's going to leave holes for it out if anybody's not privy to what was said face to face. That's part of the problem that Paul's having here. The next problem was when I mean, he wrote to them in the first letter and said that, I, that concerning the, the times and epochs, which is the coming of the day of the Lord, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel and all this, he didn't have anything to be written to you. I don't have anything to say to you because he already explained it all to them. Problem is somebody came along and told them that the rapture had already happened. The day of the Lord's already started and that they got left behind. That's why he had to write the second letter, and that's what he's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians. So the first six verses here is not talking about what's happening today. It's what's happening in his time. In his time, in the falling away that's right here. It's a little bit of confusion. I was thrown off a little bit in my first reading, and then with the, the way things that were, the, the way they were hectic last week. Remember I said I'm posting it here, but I haven't had time. Then as I was going through to do this, um, to write this featured article, then I realized that there were areas where we're going to disagree. So the, uh, the primary point is uh, where we disagree, the falling away, right? The apostasy, if you will, is a falling away, a defection, an apostasy. And you can see the word apostasy right in the Greek term. That Christ is reverencing in Matthew 24.10 saying that many will fall away. Yeah, that's a different word that means the same thing. Many will fall away, but these prophecies are fulfilled near the end of the age. That's in his time. So whenever Christ is talking about, he's, he's the Peter and the Twelve, they ask him, tell us about your coming in the end of the age, Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Christ starts giving a rundown, a rundown exactly what that, this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens, all the way down the line. This is what he gets to in verse um, 10. In verse 9, he says, they will kill you. He's talking about what's coming in the future, which is in the Great Tribulation. That's coming not until verse 21. But in verse 15 and 16 is where the subject of what Paul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians comes up. The falling away has to come first. Yep, exactly what happens. This term is only used twice. The root word is only used two times. The word that we should be concerned about for this topic is what the one that Paul used in 1 Thessalonians 4. And that's going to concern us being caught up to meet the Lord. The rapture. I say the rapture is not in there. Yes, it is too. That's when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4. So this falling away is a reference to something that's prophetic, prophecy. Paul is writing about the prophecy part. He explained that, he explained that during the day of the Lord, that when the Antichrist comes at the end of the age, the falling away is going to come first. He's giving these Thessalonians a rundown like Christ is doing in Matthew 24. Telling him what's happening at the end. Paul knows what's going to happen at the end. It doesn't apply to us today. We are living in a period just before the day of the Lord begins. Christ is just explaining in Matthew 24 how the day of the Lord ends. Two totally different things. So, um, so number one, I said, let us be clear about Paul's statements to these Thessalonians by listing a few important facts. So we're going to lay down a foundation, and then we're going to build on top of that. Paul had taught these Thessalonians face-to-face -face about the events taking place during the day of the Lord, which is why he declared in the first place. Now as to the time and epochs, 
This is the verse that you want to go to, same phrase, because it concerns the restoring of the kingdom to Israel. That's the thing Christ's disciples asked him in, right at the beginning of Acts, Acts 1, 6. Is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Christ says, it's not for you to know the time or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you be witnesses of mine, and you have blah, blah, blah. So for you, you're um, restoring the kingdom. Brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. I was referring to that a second ago. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come. It's going to start just like a thief in the night. So while Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, etc., they, they see how the day of the Lord ends with the age, only Paul has been given specific information on how the day of the Lord comes, how it begins. Paul had already told these Thessalonians exactly how the day of the Lord comes and how the day of the Lord ends with the age. However, someone told this congregation that the day of the Lord had already started, causing confusion. Because they thought members of the Thessalonian church had missed the rapture described in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is where the key word that we should be looking at appears. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. But the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Same trumpet from 1 Thessalonians 5.52. And from Revelation 1.10, that's the one everybody misses. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. There's your rapture right there. Caught up. To meet the Lord. Be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are comforting words. This comes before the destruction comes suddenly in 1 Thessalonians 5. See, the black star comes and starts the day of the Lord. That's the time we're living in right now. The black star leaves. Elijah restores all things. The temple, he preaches the gospel of the kingdom, restores the kingdom to Israel. That's the time and epoch's part coming up. Remember, the, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years. It's a long, it's going to be 3,600 years. As a thousand years is a euphemism, meaning so long as it takes. But we know the destruction that starts the day of the Lord. Paul describes the destruction coming suddenly. It's going to be a springtime black star earth crossing event. Earth's going to be tipped over. It's going to be purified by water and fire. That's going to happen. The destruction. Then the destruction comes at the end. Whenever the black star comes on the next orbit cycle. The sun doesn't give forth its light. The moon goes dark. The sun goes dark. The moon doesn't give forth its light. The same things that are going to happen when the day of the Lord starts are going to happen when the day of the Lord ends. The difference is we're going to be on the far side of the solar system in springtime whenever this event happens. It's going to be in May. It's going to be between the 17th and the 20th. We know that by the science. Whenever it happens at the end of the age, it's going to happen in November. After the black star reaches perihelion. After they see the sign of the Son of Man in the sky. After. After. That happens in November after the black star crosses Earth orbit path in May, in the May position over there, on the other side of the solar system, reaches perihelion next to the sun, and then is leaving the inner solar system. It's going to cross Earth orbit path on the way out. So Paul describes how it begins. Christ describes how it ends. Zechariah describes how it ends. Daniel describes how it ends. They don't see how it begins, though. The reason is because... God had to trick Satan. God couldn't tell anybody about this mystery time that we're living in. Got a, the diagram that's right here. Then I'll go back up. Everything that's here in red had to be hidden from Satan or else if the devil knew, then his minions would know and they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 started 6. He had to be hidden. So after God raised Christ from the dead, then he reveals, that's what the mystery, that's what my book's all about, the revelation of the mystery, the mystery part. That, those are the things that were hidden in God that he revealed afterwards through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, through revelations of Jesus Christ. So you're not going to find information re relating to the mystery in the Old Testament unless Paul points you back there and says, there it is. 
In other words, those who read it originally, to whom the words were written, didn't see it. They couldn't see it. The devil didn't even see it. After the fact, Paul can go back and say, ah, like Abraham did. Ah, like they're baptized in the body of Moses. Nobody knew anybody was baptized in any body of Moses back in the Old Testament. No concept of it. Since Paul is teaching us about the mystery of Christ, he can also teach us about the mystery of Moses and the mystery of Elijah. Members are baptized into their body. So this is where the day of the Lord begins. We're, get, we're almost there. This is where it ends. Everything that, that uh, Paul is describing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 6, pertains to, quote unquote, in his time. In his time, referring to the Antichrist, the man of sin, the prince, if you go back to Daniel, the evil guy, the one that sets up his abomination of desolation. That's the guy that quotes, Christ is quoting in Matthew. He's quoting Daniel in, in Matthew 24. But they're talking about the end of the age, not how the day of the Lord begins. So uh, I have to back up a little bit. Okay, this is where we were in Acts 1. Uh, this is where the time and epochs is used. It's only used in one other place in, in the Bible, and that's in Daniel 2. Only other place. It's only the phrase, the time and epochs, are only used three times in the whole Bible. Okay, so while Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, they see how it ends, the day of the Lord ends, only Paul sees how it begins. So yes, there's destruction on both, and that gets people confused. They think it's the same destruction, but it's not. Since Paul had already told these Thessalonians how, well, this, I've already read you this part, and then I, then I read you this section right here too. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we get up to the Greek word, and of where we are caught up, harpazo, to carry off, to seize, to carry off by force, to seize, to claim oneself um, eagerly, to claim for oneself eagerly, to snatch out or away. So whenever you read in Acts 8, this is the Blue Letter Bible version, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the, that the eunuch saw him no more. Philip was snatched away, boom gone. The eunuch is walking right there with him. Boom. Lord snatches um, Philip away. Didn't see him anymore. That's what's going to happen at our rapture. People are just going to be walking along and boom. They're going to be in their beds at night. Depends on what you're doing at the time. Boom. It's, that's what's going to happen. But it's because of what the meaning of this word. Harpazo, number 726. Not the apostasy that comes first which is also a reference. The reason that it is included in Paul's language is because he's speaking about the end of the age. Go to verse 6. Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. And you're reading about what's going to happen in his time. That's the Matthew 24, 15 time. That's in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Prophecy. If the prophets can see it, it's not in our mystery time. Okay, so then you notice in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, starts out by saying, let no man deceive you. This is, uh, this is Elena talking right here, said Danit. So I didn't have her name here. So whenever you see the phrase in the Bible, it implies that there will be strong deception in and around this topic. Absolutely. Let no man deceive you. This is the false prophets that are going out at the end of the age, confusing the gospel of the kingdom and our word of the cross gospel message. They're going to say, Christ's blood is more powerful. You need Christ's blood. Problem is, that's the gospel of the grace of God. And nobody, by the time the end of the age comes, nobody's going to be saved by the, the, the gospel of Christ's shed blood for over 3,000 years. Like nobody's been saved by the gospel of the kingdom almost 2,000 years now. People still mix it together with the gospel of the grace of God. They don't know the difference. That's going to happen at the end of the age. The, the age is going to start off. It's going to be gospel of the kingdom is the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. By the end, whenever Satan is released from his prison, he's going to be a man walking around the earth. The beast is going to be released, walking around as a man on the earth, a false prophet too. And they're going to get this movement together, and they're going to create this gospel out of the two gospels of the New Testament, like people do today. 
they're going to deceive many. That that is falling away. The apostasy that's going to come. It's going to be the they're going to use God's word the way it's used today, mixing it all together, creating all these different dominations, rather than one kingdom, one gospel, the kingdom under one king. So the um to get back up here. So why would the Holy Spirit add emphasis? Many have, um, have been deceived about the simplicity of the rapture because the truth that the rapture gives us hope and comfort. Hence, the, the enemy has worked overtime to distort the truth, which um, brings liberty and joy and replace it with deception, which brings fear and bondage. We agree on that part. Uh, understanding the apostasy um, as falling away being caught up are two different things. Our focus here is upon, because so whenever you see my writing and there's a snip, you can go back up to the, that's why I quote the entire original post, because I don't want to chop up your work, but whenever you're going on a tangent that's leading us away from the topic, then we need to stop it right there and get it back on Harpazo, Rapture. That's what we're talking about, being caught up not the apostasy that comes first. That's a, that's a, the falling away is part of prophecy that's fulfilled near the end of the age. We have the apostasy right now. We've had it since Paul's day with the mystery of iniquity. People mixing the, the truth of God's word for the water part, the gospel of the kingdom, and the blood part, the gospel of the grace of God. They mix it all together. That's what denominationalism is. They create one gospel out of two. One church out of two, the body and the bride, they mix them all together. And they they create a body of doctrine that God sent to nobody. It's nothing to do with sound doctrine. Now, I'm not I'm not uh, saying that that's what Elena's done. We're we are what scholars would would uh, consider to be splitting hairs over terms, over Greek terms. And which is the important Greek root term that we're going to use for us being caught up at the end of the at the uh, end of this dispensation of God's grace, beginning the day of the Lord when Elijah comes to restore all things? It's going to be this term. So I think that we can agree about what apostasy is, and we can we can also agree if you're going to point back to Matthew 24:10, where it is in, as a part of prophecy at the end of the age. But we're, we're nowhere near the end of the age. The day of the Lord is just about to begin. We're going to see all those things from heaven. It's one of the reasons that, and I explain that down here later, one of the reasons that Paul said to them, I don't have anything to teach you because you're going to see it all from heaven. It's not like that we're waiting for it to happen in our, in, before that we're taken in our lifetime. So um, the apostasy falling away is part of prophecy. That is fulfilled near the end of the age. While the gospel of the kingdom is going to the whole world. See, the gospel of the kingdom, go to Matthew 24, is going to the whole world, not the gospel of the grace of God. You have to know what the difference is. That helps you to realize Matthew 24 happens a long time from now. We're already done. We're in, well, we're in heaven. We're helping Elijah restore all things. The only reason Elijah can restore all things is because the, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, and all their minions are chained. We are raised up, and we are seated in those heavenly places. So the earth is going to be restored on earth as it is in heaven. Getting the bad guys out of heaven, the darkness out of the heavenly places, is what it's all about. It's what the rapture is all about. That way, we can be up here in the heavenly places. We're in the Lamb. And Peter, John, and James are out here at his right hand, serving on the sea of glass. Revelation chapter 7, 14 through 17. So God is laid out, God's word is laid out in the same pattern as the tabernacle of Moses in the temple. I'll give you another diagram that's right there. With the first veil, that's right, the first veil, right of the red mystery time above. See the first veil, it's right there, first veil. There's a veil right here and there's a veil right here, the two veils. And this is the Bible and it creates a timeline. That I'm showing you here, it's just you have to realize that this time that it's like a thousand years, as a thousand years, it's really 3,600 years. We know that from the Black Star Orbit Cycle. So, um, 
God's word is laid out in the same pattern of the tabernacle of Moses in the temple with the first veil and the second veil giving the Holy Scriptures the image of a man having a spirit, a soul, and a body. The Pauline epistles are the soul part. The kingdom epistles, there's 13 of those too. The book of Acts is neither. It's water and blood book representing the veil. That's right here. This veil over here is invisible. This veil is a person. John the Baptist, Elijah, another skin for Adam, the only son of God, little less, in the whole Bible. The only son of God, big S, in the whole Bible is Jesus Christ. Everybody else, everybody else is adopted as a son. In, the, in, the, in God and the heaven and the earth there are members of God's body, members of Christ's body, members of Adam's body, and that's all that exists in this creation. This is a picture of it. This is the highest heaven where God's seated in his son. What you don't see is that second veil is wrapped around his throne because God is infinite. So heaven and the highest heaven can't contain God, but that veil can because that veil where he is, is positioned in the center, right in the center of his son, the veil is wrapped around his throne like a giant typewriter ribbon. Remember the old days before they came out with these typewriter balls? They had typewriter... Um, well, they still have the rib, the ribbon that goes from one side to the other. That's what it's like. Wrapped from the past to the future right around God's throne. That's what the second veil... And uh, he's sitting on the other side of it. Christ is at his right hand, right in front of him, and standing right in front of them, testifying, is Adam and Eve, testifying as the man that they created. These are three realms, all in one place around the throne, um, Christ's throne, God's throne, that you see in Revelation chapter 7. So you stand with the prophets over here on the left to realize they see very well into the day of the Lord, but they don't see anything in this red section. That is why the day of the Lord comes like a thief of the night. Because no one, because none of, of, that is why it comes, because none of everything pertaining to the mystery gospel, our mystery church, and our mystery translation to immortality remained hidden in God. I got a word off in here somewhere, my apologies. Revealed through Paul's ministry using a series of revelations of Jesus Christ, like our, like our gospel. Our gospel is according to the revelation of the mystery. Our body of Christ, our mystery church. The truths about our mystery translation immortality. Paul uses the term 20 times in his epistles to describe things hidden in God revealed through his ministry. So, um, Paul is addressing these Thessalonians in these critical verses about prophecy that is being that is fulfilled in his time at the end of the age that is way over on the right side that's over here where you see the great tribulation the final judgment so on and so forth the mystery of iniquity is the mystery acts aspect that is at work since Paul's day which is the antithesis doctrine of the mystery of Christ for those being baptized in the end of the in the in any Christ body I wonder if it'll let me show you this diagram. I want to allow, I want to pull that up for you. Okay, so this is heaven. This is God, heaven, and earth right here. The, the, you can see they're divided up into their different components. So heaven is like, it's like, it's like uh, Isaac. No, it's not Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's like Jacob and Esau in the same womb there's a good half and there's a bad half it's over here the mystery of Christ is taking place over here the heavenly man Christ Jesus you are seated in the heavenly man in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus Ephesians 2 4 through 7 but the antithesis doctrine teaches Paul is teaching us about both when he's teaching us one or the other he's teaching us about both so like there are members in Christ's body here, there's members in the Antichrist body. Those that disobey our gospel, those that accept false gospels, gospels that include works, they're being tricked by the devil and given a heavenly way to go straight into the lake of fire. 
Some of us are over here. Some of us are over here. Down here, this is what New Jerusalem is coming in. 777, heavenly man. Body of Elijah, which is angels. Body of Moses, which is men. And body of Christ, that's those of us that have been restored already. With our angel half and our man half already put back together. That's why we qualify to judge the world and the angels. We are tabernacles of Christ. Christ is the tabernacle of God. We're the water witness. Christ is the blood witness. God is the spirit witness. God judges the world and the angels from within us. Because we are living tabernacles of Christ. And Christ is the living tabernacle. The true tabernacle. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Of God. So that's our role in that. But you have to realize there's an antithesis part. He who has wisdom, he will understand that 666 is the number of a man. This is the man. The devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Together they make up the three witnesses of, guess who? Satan in the infinite realm. There's no such thing as a father, son, and the Holy Spirit in the infinite realm. No such thing. That's the word. And the word is one with God. But when the word, God Ask the word incarnate as heaven, and then heaven was broken into three witnesses. That's where the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come from. But when we go back to the infinite realm, there's going to be no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there. They're temporary witnesses, testifying for a singularity who is God's word. Well, there's no such thing as the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet in the infinite realm either. No such thing. Those are the three witnesses of the singularity we know as Satan. That's the way that it works. This is the... He was cast down from here, fighting with Michael the Archangel. He died, got his head cut off, but we're in the middle of that battle. Those hosts are almost infinite hosts. From our teeny little perspective, like a drop of water, they're moving in slow motion. The whole realm is frozen. The devil's head's cut off, but it hasn't hit the ground yet. He's falling down, and his tail's going moving across the sky. And as that's happening, then the sun's... His disobedient sons are being cast down into this realm. They're occupying the heavenly places. They're, they're in the heavenly places above, and they're walking around this earth. There are people like, well, the bad guys, people that are spitefully using us and things. Right here. I don't want to say uh, Pelosi and uh, Nadler and all. I don't, want to, I don't want to go there, but that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at there. So... There's the diagram I want to show you. Open the diagram and realize that we are baptized into Christ. That's on the right side. Seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The, diso the sons of disobedience are baptized in the body of Antichrist on the left side. Elena writes, Then there is the little matter of the restrainer. If Satan had been waiting to introduce the Antichrist to the world, what is stopping him from allowing the evil leader to step onto the platform the world stage right now why is it taking so long for the devil to finally bring this man to public attention paul answered the question when he wrote second thessalonians he said now i snipped the whole quote notice that paul says and now you know in the greek the sentence can better be translated now since i've already told you these things you ought to already know this is important for it tells us that paul had already informed these thessalonians Believers about the events that occur in the last days. We agree 100% on that. And I say amen. Now you are preaching to the choir. Just exactly. We're on the same page there. However, we are nowhere near the end of the age. Since the day of the Lord is just now about to begin. So 3,500 3, years from now, we're at the end of the age. We're going to have this discussion. If we were people walking around the earth, we obeyed the gospel of the kingdom and stuff. It would be real important. We'd be seeing the apostasy. The falling away happening right before our eyes. But we're not those people. We're living in this, this mystery time. We're going to be in heaven. And see those things from heaven. For th over 3,000 years before they happen. So then I just stop and say yes. That point is made in Paul's first epistle. And then she writes. So let me ask you this. If Paul used part of his brief stay with the Thessalonian church to teach them about the events that would occur in the last days, doesn't that tell us that our understanding of the subject should be of a very high priority? Not necessarily, because he's still talking about the end of the age. It's in the first letter that he describes how the day of the Lord begins, how it comes. That destruction 
But even so, for these Thessalonians that were receiving the letter, that wasn't going to happen for 2,000 years. So we, living at the end of this dispensation of God's grace, this end of this little mystery time that contains the dispensation of God's grace, because the dispensation is not a period of time. It is a household. House, it's the affairs. Dispensation. Israel is a dispensation under Mosaic law. Peter's kingdom bride, a special dispensation, really special relationship with God under different house rules than us. We're members of Christ's body. Rules are different for us than the bride and for Israel. Um, so she says, um, we can't shut our eyes to these truths of Scripture. If Paul can considered the, this theme so important that he would introduce it to a group of new believers, how much more do we who are seasoned believers need to grasp what the Bible teaches about the last days? Every aspect of God's word is important, particularly we've been doing it for decades and decades. Then you're going to get more into, you know, the whole picture from the beginning to the end of what's going on. Me, as a Bible teacher, that my job is to help new members of Christ's body build the new man inside of them. And what that means is all scripture is living as a spirit, soul, and a body. It's a living document. So it's heaven incarnate in a book. Okay. Um, but the whole Bible is not active. Pauline epistles are active if you're a member of Christ's body today. Those that the kingdom disciples living in the day of the Lord coming up, Pauline epistles will be living, but they will not be active. The Hebrews, the Hebrew epistles. The four Gospels, Hebrews to Revelation, will be living and active for them. That's going to feed their insides. Like our insides are fed by the Pauline Epistles, Israel is fed by the Old Testament. It's important to know the difference between which parts all of Scripture is living, and it's all for you. But some of the Bible is written to you as your personal mail. That's what the Pauline Epistles are for those of us living in the world today. So, um, I just made a little, um, because I've been debating, since before the internet was ever invented, been debating scholars around the world, been doing this a long time. So if I can offer a little bit of advice, generally asking questions within the content of a thesis paper, which that's what you're writing, is you're writing your interpretations. But when you ask questions during your paper, it divides your reading audience. Don't really want to go that way. After you write your manuscript for your book or you write your thesis paper, then you want to search for every question mark and you want to change those questions into affirmative statements that are going to say something because you want your reading audience to be held together and to draw the same conclusions that you're drawing. At least you're going to build them a foundation so they can stand upon it with you and have the opportunity to draw the same conclusions because you are drawing the right conclusions. That's according to your, your hypothesis, right? So as soon as you ask a question, half your group's going to answer it differently. That divides them in two. You ask another question, they're going to divide them into four. For every question, then it's going to divide them into eight, then 16, then 32. Groups, different people that answer your questions a different way. So that's just my advice. That's uh, one of the rules that I follow. So one reason that Paul had no reason to teach him about these time and epochs is because Paul had already told them these things face to face. But the second reason is that the, is that the rapture takes place at the start of the day of the Lord. So the Thessalonians are going to see these things from heaven. So, and then I, I, I say to read the uh, Paul's words to the Colossians very carefully to realize that the body of Christ returns with Christ in great glory. Many people miss that too. When Christ is revealed, then we're going to be revealed with him in great glory. So we are among those who come at Matthew 24 at the end of the age. Remember, we've already been with him for 3,600 years. We've been running the show in heaven. We just watched Satan with his three witnesses, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet overcome at the end of the age. We're going to be part of that army that comes back. We're going to gather the, the elect that obeyed the eternal gospel from Revelation. Um, the eternal gospel from Revelation 14.6. So that's what I'm speaking of right here, the eternal gospel. 
So we return with him in Matthew 24. It's not that Christ is about to come to the end of the age. Christ is going to come and he's going to take us at his mystery coming. Nobody sees him. He does, his feet doesn't touch the ground. We meet him in the air. We go back to heaven with him. The day of the Lord starts. And we're, and we're with him for the entire time. We get judged. We are placed in those heavenly seats according and arranged just the way God wants us. Some of us are given high places of authority. Some, some of us have low places of authority. But we're going to be there helping Elijah in the restoration of all things. Lena wrote, Paul told uh, the Thessalonian uh, believers that the force withhold, that a force withholdeth the Antichrist from being revealed. Although Greek doesn't specify, uh, doesn't specifically state the identity of the restraining force, it seems to suggest that Paul is referring to a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm snipping it off instead of the whole argument being presented. And I think I'm, I'm going to, instead of reading this out to you, I'm just going to kind of characterize. The restrainer is the spirit of prophecy. That's what the restrainer is. A lot of people struggle with this. They want to make it something other than what it is. The Holy Spirit plays a role in that. The spirit of God's spirit plays a role in that. But in God's word, the way it's laid out, the way it's written, plays a role in it too. So, for example, Jesus Christ tells the disciples, um, gives the disciples a rundown on how things shake out um, at the end of the age in Matthew 24. So when you read through the laundry list, which I've done with others, I, I believe it did with Brian. The falling away comes first. And then only then can the gospel of the kingdom go. Of course, there's wars, rumors of wars, there's earthquakes and things like that because the black star is coming again. People are getting freaked out like they are right now because the black star is coming. Only then, after the, the gospel of the kingdom goes to the whole world, Matthew 24, 14. Only then can the Antichrist set up his abomination of desolation in the temple that has to be restored already. He obviously cannot come and set up the holy, his abomination of desolation in the holy place if there's no temple. Got to have the temple. Got to have the holy place, right? Got to have the kingdom around the temple. So it's no mystery that it's, it's, it's more than just the Holy Spirit. That's the restrainer here. There are other prophecies that have to be fulfilled first. That's the spirit of prophecy that is the restrainer. Antichrist is not going to come for 3,600 years and people are out looking out their window for him right now. I'm just shaking my head. He cannot come yet. Elijah's got to restore the kingdom first, the temple. Israel's going to grow as a great nation, fulfill all the words of the prophets of old. The kingdom goes from the great river of Egypt all the way to Euphrates. That hasn't happened. So many things haven't happened so that other things can't happen either. That's really what the what is what the restrainer is. So whenever you see whenever those living at the end of the age, whenever they see the apostasy, they see the earthquakes, they see the tsunamis, they see everything that's in that list, then the gospel of the kingdom is going to go to the whole world and the end's going to come. The last disciple, the, the great tribulation comes afterwards, Matthew twenty four, twenty one. You can't have the great tribulation, right, until the abomination of desolation, until the temple's restored. So there's a laundry list of things that have to happen. And number Z item on the prophecy fulfillment list cannot be fulfilled until all of these other ones are fulfilled first. Beginning with the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Acts 1, 6 through 7. That was why that was right on their, right on the top of their minds. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says, not for you to know. This 2,000-year mystery time had to happen first, then the restoration of the kingdom of Israel during the time and epochs period, which is the day of the Lord that's coming up. So Peter tells us why, this is Elena, tells us why the Spirit of God is stalling, delaying, postponing the dreadful time at the end of the age. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish. So he's holding back the ultimate day, and this is going to make perfect sense to those that are living near the end of the age. But we're living in a time before the day of the Lord has even started. Um, 2 Peter 3, another difficult chapter. 
But Peter says, do not let it escape your notice that to the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. That's verse 8. Then, see, we, we jumped right to, to verse 9 here. So you have to give the day of the Lord a, it is a period. It's a time. It's an epoch. Time and epoch thingy. The kingdom's got to be restored before it can be destroyed. It's got to be restored first. We're not there yet. Peter's describing, and uh, we, we went through that here recently. There's a difference between the day of the Lord that's coming, Paul talks about. There's a difference in the day of the Lord that is as a thousand years that Peter was talking about in the same chapter. There's a difference between that day of the Lord, which is a the restoration of all things for Israel, time and epochs and stuff. But then there's the great and terrible day of the, of the Lord, or the day of God. It's, it's, it's uh, characterized different ways. That is an event. That is an event that happens after the judgment of Revelation 20, verse 15. Notice whenever you get the Revelation 21.1, I mean, the lights come on, new heaven, new earth, and all that. But the the former, there were no place for the for the former heaven and earth because they're done, they're gone. That's the destruction by fire that is going to come at the end of the age when the black star comes on the next orbit cycle, and all these other things happen first. We're going to see all those things from heaven, and like I said. I've just characterized exactly what it, see this is exactly what I just told you here. Second Peter three, that's more. When you get down to verse fourteen, then that's where Peter mentions Paul. And he says he talks about the wisdom given him and how people distort it as they do and this is what I'm saying right here to the rest of their as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. The mystery that was given to Paul. He writes about it in Ephesians 3. He writes about it throughout his epistles. These are things that were given to him by revelation. Jesus Christ revealed them to him so he could reveal them to us. So when, when, and you're going to want to click here and read. The, let me let me allow. Let me click this. Let me read a little bit of this to you. It's very important. That I dissect this definition in my book, The Mystery Explained. The uh, Mysterion. Mystery, primarily that which is known to the musties, the initiated. Those you got, you guys read my book. You read about the mystery. I guess there's biblical basis for you being called the initiated. If you can see God's hidden wisdom, using His three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water, that's what this is really about. Okay, so from Muyo. To initiate into the mysteries, I have learned a secret. In the new T, it denotes not the mysterious. That's not what the word means. But that which, being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension, can only be made known by the revelation, by divine revelation, and is made known in a manner and at a time appointed by God, and to those who only, very exclusive here, those only who are illumined by his spirit. In the ordinary sense, mystery implies knowledge withheld. Its spiritual significance is truth revealed. Hence the terms specifically associated with the subject are made known, manifested, revealed, preached, understand, and dispensation. The definition given above may best be illustrated by the following passage. The mystery which has been hid from all ages and generations but now has it been manifested among his saints. Very similar to what Paul writes at, to end Romans. Romans. There's, notice there's two end, endings of Romans. It ends twice. The last three verses were added to the received text, the Antiochian manuscripts, after it had why it was already circulating. Paul added the final three verses that read almost exactly what you're reading right there. So the critical text, the old Byzantine. They do not include those three verses because they are the older manuscripts. They were shipped to Egypt early on and they were copied and copied and copied. That's why you have the two different sets of uh, manuscripts, Antiochian and the, or the received text and the critical text, the, um, the older being the critical, the um, Egyptian manuscripts. 
So, I mean, that's as much as I really need to read to you about the mystery that Paul, where God is revealing things through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. When people try to combine what Paul is revealing as part of the mystery, which our rapture is right there because First Thessalonians, uh, First Corinthians 15, start at 51. All right. Paul's about to talk about that last trumpet, just like he's talking about here. He's going to talk about how we're changed. But he says, first starts it right off, behold. Uh, and he attaches the word mystery right to it. This is, every time Paul uses that word, it means he's about to reveal something that was not, it's not a part of prophecy. Nobody ever saw it because it was hidden in God. Now it's being revealed based on this definition that you're looking at right here. So, um, on God's, is that calendar? The Hebrew, the second month is, okay. And you were making a point with this right here. And then I had to say, this, uh, this date that you came to see is May 11th, 2020. You, 2000, th there's, hey, I haven't mentioned this to you guys, but there's another researcher. I haven't had time to even answer many of my emails, and I apologize for that. But I did read one. It was all written in red, and is a fella that's like me. He's like a Christian. He's got his Christian side going. He's got like the science going on one side. And guess the date that he's worried about. He's been following this, this celestial object for the last four years or something. May the 18th. One day after my date for this cycle. So um, I want to get there whenever I can. Then, um, so I say, well, the Black Star event timeline, the back Black Star event timeline currently includes May 17, 2020, possible Black Star Earth crossing date. So that's what I want to share in um, Deb uh, debating God's word, you have to have kind of a thick skin. So I hope that, uh, Lane, I hope you're not offended. That uh, you give yours, I give mine. It's all it's based on logic, based on God's living word and our interpretations. You see things this way, I see things this way. And um, if you, I'm happy, if you see anything in here, you'd like to send me a rebuttal or anything like that, happy to, uh, happy to do that. Then, um, uh, let me show you a little bit of what's going on the the, uh, the coronavirus and there's a uh, there's uh, Gary's down here that I want to show you also about God's love really really good then uh, let's see here this is the web this is the website where I go this is uh, where I just defended right here my two gospels of the New Testament my apologies I did not have time to Pardon me. I didn't have time to debate. It just wasn't enough time. It's like 60 new subscribers this week. And processing about that many silver orders. And from the sun coming up to the sun go down until late at night, I'm working every day. And try, trying to get this uh, place remodeled so so that I can get, get the heck out of Dodge. So I, my apologies for that still a ton of great information that's in here this is where that i hope that you guys will go see christianforums.com i go to the dispensationalism room elena's a dispensationalist and many of the ladies that taught me when i was young they were dispensationalists too i can't consider myself a dispensationalist um because i mean if you would if you were going to call me that then i'd be an acts nine guy but the, there, there's so many different kinds of dispies and the, I haven't found a group of them that would take me into their their herd, if you will, because of the different views, the three witnesses, and things like that. They don't they don't see any of that stuff. So um, anyway, this is where I hope that you'll go. This is where you can read my comments. This is where you can ask me questions on my topic, you know, and then you send, send me an email and say, hey, I wrote on this topic, and then I I can answer you here, and it helps the people that read this board, and it we can put it in the newsletter and help those people too. This is the website that I use, and I like to use the New American Standard Bible. Um, using the critical text, which I use the received text, the New King James, for 10 years, my first 10 years of my ministry. And then decided it was time to check out the other side, and I've been there ever since. Neither is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. Everybody makes mistakes. There's copyist errors. There's a couple of thousand copyist errors in both versions. 
not because of the original copies that were made, but because of copyists. These are letters that were copied and copied and copied and copied. Copyist errors. And some of that's been fixed. Some of that has not been fixed. But the Holy Spirit's the one that leads us. Then on the, the coronavirus, this is still just getting started. The United States, they say that now there's 53. That's going to be have to do with their moving, pe shifting people. Got a pretty big dot right here in the middle of the country. Where is this? Oklahoma, Kansas. Got something that's going on there. But anyway, this is the the major story. This is the one. It just came out. Coronavirus update. The CDC warns Americans to prepare for disruption. That's an understatement. Get your nano silver so you have a shield against this thing. My nano silver is right here in front of me. Doug's nano silver. Teaspoon. It's already mixed. Ready to go. One teaspoon in the morning. One teaspoon in the evening. Hold it under your tongue. Let your body absorb the nano silver. Have it in your system, and it's like I said, it should be part of your of your survival strategy moving forward. What happens whenever we can't go to the pharmacy? What happens if you have an infection? You have, you have a uh, contagion. Then you're going to have to have something. And this the the deal that Doug is giving us is a great great deal. We could be charging a lot more than what we're charging. And you guys have the opportunity as subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, be a newsletter subscriber, so that uh, you can you can um, take advantage of this opportunity before the crap hits the fan. 30 days we could be in lockdown. 30 days there may not be an internet. So I'm just saying that um, fi I finished my radio interview with Eric, and it's uh. The link is posted in the Black Star newsletter for anybody that's interested in, in that information. So this is the big story that popped out and along with the uh, the one from yesterday or the day before where uh, they don't know the gestation period. The, the incubation period of this thing, they don't know. They're thinking now it's 27 days. But the thing is it's going to be a range. For some people, this thing, they're going to get it and it's going to start presenting itself in three days. Like a normal bug and some people it's going to stay in two weeks some people three weeks some people four five six seven weeks and it's not going to present itself they're going to carry it they're going to shed it and they're never going to have a, have a uh, even a runny nose or anything and it's so it spreads so easy one of the, this mask is not going to stop the bug it's not going to stop it this not the the, the holes that are in here are not uh even if it's the N rated, the N95, N100, that's still rated for 3.3 microns, which is 300 nanometers, and this bug's only 50 to 70 nanometers in diameter. But what these masks will do is they will help you to remember not to self infect. You can have it on your hands, so it hasn't gotten into your body yet, and then people touch the sides of their mouth, the sides of their, their eye, inside their nose, and they get to the membrane, and then you get infected. So you, you want Doug's Nano Silver in your system so that as soon as that bug gets in you, it kills it. You don't have time to be an incubator and you don't have a time to pass it on to other members of your family either. Just remember, just because you you take the Nano Silver and you're killing it from the inside, that doesn't mean if it's on your hands that you can't spread it to other people. So it's the same rules for uh, for other uh, flu bugs and things. You know, washing your hands often, things like that. Four new subscribers this week. That is, uh, did I miss somebody? There's, there's Stan, oh, Stephen, Stan, and William. There's 35 subscribers now. And I remember that there was somebody that was missed right through here. Oh, yeah. Trevor. Trevor subscribed, but he wasn't on here. He got included here, too. There's Rebecca, the survival group lady. So, anyway. Looks like three new subscribers could have sworn there was four. I'm thinking that I missed somebody. And William purchases autographed number copy of the Mystery Explained with a don donation at the website. William has done just about everything. He's, I believe he's in the military. He's overseas. And he's, uh, he's subscribed to both newsletter, both premium programs for the Black Star and for the Mystery Report. And he purchased my book. And he purchased Nano Silver too. 
appreciate your support very, very much, William. Well, how do you join the chat room activities? People write, as long as people are asking me that I'm going to include it right here, how do you receive? If you're a YouTuber, you're not yet a newsletter subscriber, then you can stop this video and read the instructions. If you just go to the website, there these video links are right there above the PayPal buttons for each um, section of Mystery Report and for Black Star. How do you receive the newsletters? $2 option, $4 option per month. But when I say that, it doesn't mean you pay 2 bucks. It's one payment once a year of $25. You make a payment, you're going to get 57 newsletters this year, and your payment, you're going to get the Dropbox folder link next year if the Black Star don't come. You're going to get that in January. You're going to have access to 52 of those newsletters too before your next payment's due on the anniversary of your original subscription. That's the way that it works. And everybody that subscribes gets a copy of my book, The Mystery Explained, the ebook version, attached to your notification email. If you don't know how, if you've never had a PayPal account, it is easy. I've had one since 2004. It's really simple. Just click right here, how to create your... It's, uh, whenever you go to the website, obviously you can't click in the newsletter. I guess I could activate the link. But um, when you go to the website, you click right there, it should give you instructions on exactly how to do that. Clarifying statements, I defend the two Gospels of the New Testament. Did that just a little while ago. This fellow here, he's going to quote the whole Bible, and he gives you two sentences of commentary. That, uh, in, in the debating, in debating, is a lightweight guy. You really want to give, you quote three verses, and then give two paragraphs of what that really means. Then we can analyze, look at it from different directions, and, and agree with you or disagree with you. But when you're quoting a whole chapter... And then you're just putting a K at the end like, okay, you know, we did that. No, you have to say what it means. So you've got your interpretations. I've got mine. We've all got our interpretations. We're reading the same Bible. But we all interpret it different ways. That's why there's so many different denominations. It's your interpretation that is that makes the difference. That's what's going to help us to understand what you're trying to share, not just quoting the, the verses. I mean, it's important to quote scripture, don't get me wrong, but just quoting scripture and, and thinking, well, that, everybody's going to interpret it the way I do, that does, that does not work because everybody interprets scripture using their own glasses. This is the one I wanted to share with you. Hold on just once. Now, my apologies for that. That uh, phone call I had to take it. The, uh, one of my doctors was calling. Uh, God's Love, written um, by Gary and myself. And this is what Gary writes. Um, God loves the church with a love too deep for human imagination. He loves her with all his infinite heart. Therefore, let her sons be of good courage. She cannot be far from um, prosperity to whom God speaks gracious and comforting words. The prophet goes on to tell us, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. The Lord Loves his church so much that he cannot bear that she should stray, should go astray to others. And when she has done so, he cannot endure that she should suffer uh, too much or too heavily. So then he asked me, Terrell, how do you reconcile the above as written by the prophets about Zion and his love for them against the love he has for the body of Christ? That will be over the kingdom of heaven and will judge them. Because we're going to judge the world and the angels. That's um, first. Corinthians chapter 6, 2 and 3. So then he says, right now I'm thinking that he loves us all the same, but because they rejected him when they had the chance. So he is making them pay for their rejection. What do you think? The, um, the point that I just crossed my mind that I didn't make to Gary is this word right here, us. The prophet goes on to tell us. Because the prophet is not addressing us. He's not addressing members of Christ's body. The prophets could not even envision that anybody is going to be judging the world and the angels other than them. Right? The, or that anybody other than God would would make a claim like, of anything like that. And if you want to, to uh, see a blank stare, then ask a Jew, a practicing Jew, about eternity in heaven. Because he, that's not what the Jews believe. They don't die and go to heaven. They, they die and go to Sheol in the earth. And 
on the last day they're raised up and they're led into the promised land just read ezekiel 37 start and start right there with a the valley of bones that's what israel believes so the idea of the concept of what paul is teaching us is totally foreign to them and so paul is and god is speaking to us through paul in his 13 epistles god is speaking to kingdom disciples living in the day of the lord that's coming in hebrews all the way through revelation and in the four gospels 13 kingdom books written to them although it's written for us it's written to them through the gospel of the kingdom okay so here, here's my reply i say thank you for, for writing for creating the opportunity for clarifying statements on the topic of god's love for israel and our mystery church so this is at the beginning when he's writing gracious words and they're they're recognized as the start of Zechariah, right at the bottom of the first chapter then the angel of the lord said uh the angel of the lord said lord of hosts how long will you have no compassion for Ju for jerusalem and the cities of judah with which you have been indignant these 70 years the lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words comforting words so the angel who was speaking with me said to me proclaimed saying thus says the lord of hosts i'm exceedingly um zealous for jerusalem and zion zechariah 1 12 to 14. so first off allow me to point out that the angel of the lord is the one speaking and the lord is answering the the angel messenger so when you say that term angel remember that in the old testament hebrew and the new the new testament greek that the word for messenger and angel is the same word the messenger of the, of the is sometimes translated messenger of the lord sometimes angel of the lord then um, so the angel of the lord is speaking to the lord is answering the angel messenger with gracious words the lord here is our lord jesus christ who is the lord god of genesis 2 4 plus doing his consecration work on the seventh day as high priest standing at the right hand of God so God rested in Genesis 2 1 through 3 in his son that's the thing when you realize that God is resting with well, people just get an imagine that God's sitting down somewhere you know he's not working no yeah he's resting but where did he rest he's resting in his son so the Lord God is out doing his works but he's a tabernacle whenever you're looking at the Lord God in Genesis 2 4 onward that is pointing directly to the Lamb of God in heaven the Lord God and the Lamb of God same person inside of him and is God that's where God resides in his son Christ is the tabernacle of God he walks around he's carrying God around with them the same way you and I are tabernacles of Christ who is a tabernacle of God so we're carrying Christ around Christ carrying God around three witnesses of spirit blood and water God Christ and you three witnesses in one person so God is resting in his son to take up his work on the seventh day the key for understanding here is within the re the uh, realization that Israel was the only household the only dispensation on our on our planet at the time the angel of the Lord was testifying to Zechariah as the kingdom bride in the body of Christ were not yet in existence now yes there were other dispensations hundreds of them thousands of them but we're talking about the three primary dispensations of God's Word Israel the flesh the kingdom bride and the mystery body that's it the other the other dispensations are inconsequential they exist yeah some people want us to limit the number the angels are part they have special dispensation with God a special relationship cherubs they guard things they're they, they don't live under the same house rules as you do guarantee you that they're in a different dispensation so for every group of angels you have up there for there are different this God has been in the creation business for an infinite amount of time and he has relationships with all kinds of beings that he created 
So there, there's, in, in reality, millions and millions of dispensations. Every time God makes something new, he has a new relationship with it. He can say, go be fruitful and multiply, like the six-day people, special dispensation. Six-day people have direct dispensation with God. We can't say that. Our relationship with God is through his son. We're seventh-day people. Every seventh-day person has a relationship with God through his son, the Lord God who made Adam. This to start the thing off. Those from the generations before Adam's recent incarnation, six-day people, Chinese people, or the Orient people, the people flying around the spaceships, they have direct dispensation with God. They're not here to be judged. They're here as victims, members of Adam's body in the infinite realm who were killed the day that, that Adam killed him. I mean, that Satan murdered him. Okay. So, the, um, let's see if I can get my, my train of thought back here. My apologies, my, um, my mind is trying to slip on me a little bit. So, God rested in his son to take up this work. The key for understanding is that Israel is the only household. The thing to realize, even so, the important fact to keep in mind is that the Lord God has issues with Israel from the beginning and promised to make them jealous. He says, they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked, provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest part of Sheol. That's where every son of Israel went before Christ led captivity captive. And consumes the earth with its yield and sets the fire of of foundations of the mountains so here's the thing to realize well first um, just read Paul's statements in, in Romans 7 Romans 11 7 through 11 to realize the Lord God has an issue with Israel that will play out for the ages and this is the important part over things already done Everybody that's born as a Jew on this planet has something in common. And it goes back to the infinite realm where we're gods. It has to do with this idolatry, idolatry thing. And so we're doing things, Ecclesiastes 1 through 9. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything we're doing has already been done. We're replaying, redoing things that have already been done over and over and over again these different lifetimes in order to replay accounts of what happened in the infinite realm where we're infinite gods. We keep in mind that heaven and earth are created and that God, God's infinite realm is the only realm that's real. This is the only realm that's real. This is all created. We're going to wind up back here and where Adam was murdered, Adam's going to stand up being restored right before our eyes. It's going to seem like it happened instantly. But right now, we're within this, this envelope of time and space. Everything here is frozen motionless. And from our perspective over here, in the heaven and the earth, heaven, heaven, and the earth, this entire realm is almost infinite. It's frozen motionless, too. It's moving in super-duper-duper duper slow motion. This realm is not going to move at all. This heaven and earth will be remade hundreds and hundreds of times, and that one split second will not pass in the infinite realm. The time differentials between heaven and earth will become less and less, the differential. This is almost infinite. This is like a drop of water now. But as the heaven and earth are remade time and time and time again, they get closer and closer to the same size. That changes things because heaven won't be frozen from our perspective any longer like it is now. Michael the archangel and the, and the dragon are fighting right now. They're in the... Michael just swung the, the, his sword and just cut off his head. And that happened in the time of Genesis. And it's still playing out right now. It's moving in such slow motion. Like giant constellations. So keep in mind the heaven and earth are created. That's the only realm that's real. So yes, we all know very well that Israel is the Lord's chosen race. But the question concerns chosen for what? Read the passage from 1 Timothy 2, 9 
through 15 very carefully to realize Eve is in the same boat with Israel committing the transgression, precisely as we see with Israel in Romans 11, 11. Same thing. I say then, they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression. Salvation is thus the same thing it said about the woman. Since she fell into to transgression. So salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. They do not even, well, let me just read, or else I'll tell you everything twice. Paul did not skip one beat in making the connection between their transgression and to make them jealous, because God and his word have serious issues with those born onto this planet we know as the sons of Israel, going all the way back to God's infinite realm. The short of the long story is that Israel will work and work and work, preparing in the mirrors. They're going to, if you read these verses, You'll see that they're working, they're cleaning their garments, they're getting all pristine and pure looking and getting all ready because they're working for it. God gives us that for free. To earn what God gives us for free. Israel today has insufficient knowledge about God's plan and the larger picture to even realize just how jealous they will be once they finally join us in Christ Jesus in the Lamb until they finally graduate to behold our glory in Christ Jesus. The members of Christ's body obeying our gospel are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus with their man angel halves restored while Peter, John, and James will be the very last to join us in their glorified forms in Christ Jesus at the ages of the ages. That's another Greek euphemism. God is showing all of his mighty angels that his grace is greater than all the works of men and angels combined using the members of Christ's body through God's grace and forgiveness for all the ages to come. He's going to extend his grace upon us. He saved us because he saved us. His power, he bestowed upon us his righteousness so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. So he has a purpose for it, purpose for the ages. That's why he created a mystery body. That's why he's created a prophetic bride to make intercession. They're going to stand out there right in front of the Lamb for ages and serve the Lamb. And then finally, finally get inside the Lamb and then realize that we've been there, that we've been there seemingly from the beginning, but that we're the goy. They're the, we're the goy that they've been talking about. That's, a, that's like a dog. So Israel is looking down on those of us that have been given higher places. And God is pulling kind of a nasty trick. Um, by, he's making them all um, jealous, but it all goes back to the infinite realm. There's a reason for it. God, you, you know, God's a good guy, but he is—he's uh, just and he's righteous, and he has an issue, and God does something about it. Kind of reminds me of Trump and the uh, the Iranian general. You know, he didn't just sit by. He 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 blew the guy's truck to kingdom come. <laughs> So uh, you're referencing the fact that we judge the world and the angels, which in reality means that we are tabernacles of Christ, who is the true tabernacle of God, incarnate in us. That is, Christ in you, this mystery among the Gentiles. So that's the preacher preaching. This is uh, the faith of Jesus, which is our possession, is, is attached to the spirit of the word and the Holy Spirit of promise. That makes the man, new man that takes up residence inside of our soul, right here. But then inside of God, I mean inside of Christ, the Son of God, then God is there reconciling the world to himself through the work of his Son, through you. That's how we're going to judge the world and the angels like this. God is going to be the one that's inside of us. We're going to be his tabernacle in this finite room. So the key here is that God rested in his son, that he is in Christ always reconciling the world to himself, which means the Almighty works through Christ in you to judge the world and the angels. Figure three shows us how God is in Christ in you, making you the water witness, Christ the blood witness, and God's the spirit witness. Israel will pay for transgressions against God and his word that took place in God's infinite realm long before the heaven and earth were created. In Genesis 1.1, the key here is 
that choice for all Seventh-day people was decided already in God's infinite realm, representing the cause, while the heaven and earth represent the created realms of effect. We are all doing things already done in this earth that coincides precisely with what has been done already in God's infinite realm. Israel has locked down, has looked down upon Gentiles for thousands of years, but the tables turn in heaven. Watch and see. Appreciate very much, Gary, you sending me the uh, your email that creates the opportunity to go into some of these different passageways to show the different aspects of what's going on. Holy cow, it's an hour and 20 minutes. I'll, uh, I'll run through this. Coronavirus, Italy is, is getting hit pretty hard. And uh, there are fewer deaths to the coronavirus than the, the common flu that's going. So what's the big deal? This is a very big deal. It's a very big deal. The nature of this bug is just getting started. And it seems to me they're not going to be able to make a, uh, a vaccine for it because the thing's going to keep mutating. The vaccine will work for somebody somewhere, maybe the novel virus. But when this thing hits different populations with different genetic propensities, then it changes. It does things in a different way. And there's also a 5G connection to this thing. This 5G network is coming out. Um, Dana Ashley was, was uh, kind of warning us about that. I hear that she's making another video on that. I wish Dana Ashley would have me on. Um, I've written her and I've asked, and she stopped answering me, you know, some time ago. So, um, really nice lady, really like her work. She's real smart, and God bless her. The, I'm, I'm gonna get be able to watch her video whenever I can get some time um, away from um, doing my regular work here. Uh, the next economic recession will likely come from a climate crisis. Re, uh, the researchers are saying that's uh, likely going to be because of the coronavirus. Pretty darn sure about that. Think about what happens when the supply chains stop coming from China, who makes things for all people all over the world, for parts, for cars, for all kinds of appliances and things. Not even the new stuff. Parts for the to maintain your stuff. Getting parts. I mean, this is a wake-up call for the Americans to be self-sufficient. Because if you're going to wait on China to make everything and then they go down for the count like they are right now, what are you going to do then? They make the penicillin. They make drugs. We are relinquishing too much of our responsibility as Americans over here for our own people, depending on foreign nations, especially our enemies. And that's not the smart thing to do. Loving your enemies is the Christian innovation to combat the culture of, of complaint. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to agree with that. It seems like the left is, is in the United States, and I know it's going to be that way in the UK. Now they've been de dealt that big uh, victory, the, the service. But um, Trump, Trump's going to devastate anybody coming against him. That's what I think. And the left is just going to keep whining. They're going to want to impeach. They're going to, they're angry about all the judges, the conservative judges are going in there. You're hearing about the Supreme Court judges. They're being asked to recuse themselves. They can't do that. But they have to be, must be impartial. They have to be impartial. The statements that they're making, they're being foolish. They're supposed, they have to stand in the middle and the gap between Republicans and Democrats. They don't caucus. And they, they follow the law. They do not run the country. That's the president's job. Congress makes the laws. The president enforces the laws. And the judges, they decide. They interpret the law and apply it to each case. But they can't write their own laws. And do whatever they want to do. And, and uh, I, I have heard that President makes statements. And people have been saying that. though he can do what he want to do. They're paraphrasing him. He was saying that he can do whatever he wants to do with the impeachment. He can make it go long or he can make it go short. Depending on what he wants to do personally. They decided to go short. Which was smart, I think. But they took that. And they, they spin doctors. And they turned it all around to mean that he can do whatever he wants as President. Well, of course he can't do that. But if Trump was a bad guy. They would have more on him in the three years, more than three years now, than a six-minute phone call. They would have all kinds of, they have a long laundry list, and they don't have it. Now they've cried wolf too many times. Nobody's going to believe them. And that's all, they're, they have no other choice but just to cry like babies. Famine looms, Exodus, which you get in um, Exodus-like plagues, locusts. 
This is happening in a lot of places. And it happens because the black star is coming in, in um, storms, freaky weather, hot weather where it's cold, and cold weather where it's hot, storms. Then you get these arid areas that get two inches of rain per year, and they get 20 inches of rain in a day. And then they have all this vegetation that's growing. Seeds have been laying and dormant in the ground for so long, and then they all start germinating. And they grow, and, and the grasshoppers are there. They're everywhere. But when you give them the big food supply, they start eating and reproducing. And, and then they have so much food, they grow into swarms. And that's when you call them, that's just a grasshopper. That's all it is. But when you get too many grasshoppers, then they're locusts. And um, that's what's happening around the world right now as we speak. With the Mexican border, and this is what I, this is what I really saw. And uh, Mayor Pete's Bible, <laughs> study ignores sexual immorality. I would, uh, I'm would, i just rubbing my head wondering, I mean, if America is ready to have a, uh, a gay president, then it's just time for us to pack the bags. Let's just, let's just go home. Because uh, I'm sorry, but um, just read Romans chapter 1. Paul, he wrote to the Romans, was the greatest empire at the time. They were under Roman rule. He felt like if he could knock Rome down, he could conquer the whole world. Uh, Romans. The first chapter is he addresses Mayor Pete and those with a depraved mind and all that stuff. Thou plunges. Watch for more of the c c coronavirus fears. That I'm not kidding you. If I When I open up my mailbox, then it's pages of people subscribing, people wanting their nano silver. That's what's going on. Um, right now it has me backed up so usually this video will be made in the morning I, um, my apologies I haven't had time so you're probably wondering what's happened to me and uh, so the uh, the coronavirus is what's going to affect the economy and uh, as you see that the the, the economy is going to take more of a hit you're going to see limitations on our movement in the United States then you're going to see the precious metals skyrocket so those of you that are getting into silver below twenty dollars you're getting in on something that's really good it's going to go above twenty it's going to go above thirty it's going to go above forty when it gets to about forty seven fifty JP Morgan will no longer cover cover the silver short position and people are going to be jumping out of windows around the world you, you that's looks like that's what's going to be happening here pretty soon so I watched the price of silver and I watched the uh, elites that are, are flying these are the signs of our times that the uh, that the black star is almost here this is what's coming to the United States in areas of China, people are being arrested if they don't have a mask, even though the mask isn't doing them any good. There's all kinds of... Uh, here's how to make your own coronavirus protective mask. Submitted by Bonnie. Want to include that in here so you have something. What the mask is going to do for you, really, is going to keep you from self-infecting. So you're not going to be able to touch the inside of your nose. You have the mask on. But the, uh, the little bitty, bitty bug is going to collect in that mask. And if it's on a water droplet, it's on a particulate that it comes in your mask. Eventually, it's going to be sep it's going to separate from that. Well, the, the the water droplet is going to evaporate to leave the bug. And it is way way smaller than the holes in any of these masks that I'm seeing. Way smaller. The idea is to have the nano silver in your in your veins, in your bloodstream, so that when you this this guy gets you, that it gets killed. That it dies and so then you're not an incubator and a carry for the thing so here's your instructions right here nano silver that's going to be your answer you can take that and realize that you're going to be protected that you have a shield against it fitness blogs down at the bottom I'll leave that in there for you guys every week a lot of great links that are in there appreciate your support very very much and um Get more information right here at the website, right over here. This is where you subscribe to the program. To the uh, if you just want the newsletter, like the one I just showed you, get 57 of those in this Dropbox folder because 2019 and 2020 are combined. And then you want to join us on Tuesday nights, tutor chat, raise your hand, ask questions, interact with other uh, Christians. We do that on Tuesday nights, seven o'clock. Then you'll 
this is a $50 per year. And I'm going to, next time I update the site, I'm going to be putting per year here. Because some people are under the impression that, oh my goodness, that's per month. No, it's per, it's per year. And then everybody gets a copy of my book, The Mystery Explained. The ebook version attached. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining me in this weekly update report. And um, I've been praying for more time, but it looks like that I'm not going to get more time. Looks like we're just going to be have, have less time. So at that point, then we do our very best and God does the rest, right? Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next mystery report.